Thank you all for the privilege and the opportunity to be here today. I do have to speak to the organizers about letting me follow a professor of neuroscience from Brown, but we'll work on that later. Um, I want us to stop for a minute. There's been a lot of heavy, exciting, dense data that's been presented, but let's think about what it means to actually be part of a community. And what does that mean to each of you and to each of us? Community is defined as a feeling of fellowship with others, as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals, and having a particular characteristic in common. I hear the word community a lot at this meeting and be, being lucky enough to work within the Duchenne space, and I just wanted to say thank you. The community is something really special, and thanks to Pat and PPMD for showing us all how to do it right. I work for a company called Wave Life Sciences. To those of you that I haven't met yet, my name is Wendy. I lead patient advocacy for Wave. I think it's really important for everyone to understand that as a very early stage preclinical company, Wave made a commitment to patient advocacy. And I like to say we walk the talk. It was really important to us to have your voices at the table as we built out our clinical development plans for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You've seen a lot of these slides this week, but why is it important? We're a public company. We're making forward-looking statements. To me, that means we're making hopeful statements. We're predicting what we want to be able to do in the clinic and beyond. So this is a really important slide. Um, there's a lot of verbiage here, but if you think, if you kind of go down to the middle, it talks about contemplate, believe, estimate, predict, potential. That's what we all want this to turn into reality. We're a genetic medicines company developing targeted nucleic acid therapies for patients impacted by rare diseases. We do this with a rationally designed nucleic acid approach optimized by a process called stereochemistry. We have three lead neurology candidates initiating clinical trials in 2017. Hold on, we're in 2017. We plan to have three programs in the clinic by the end of this year. Our first two are in a rare genetic disease called Huntington's disease that is also neurologic, and our third program is in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We have a total of six development programs planned by the end of 2018, and our core focus and expertise is in neurologic rare diseases. In addition, we've made a very early and big commitment to build manufacturing, and we have 90,000 square feet of manufacturing space outside of Boston that we are on track to occupy by the middle of this month. So as you've heard, Duchenne's a tough disease to treat. It's an even tougher disease to live with. These drugs are really hard and complicated to make, and we wanted to make sure we were prepared to be able to do that in the right way long beyond the clinical trials. This is a quick overview of the company. Um, thank you, Stu, for being a pioneer in this space. It takes a long time, and it starts well before most of you ever hear about a company. Um, we hired our CEO in 2013. His name is Paul Bolno, and he is committed to becoming a Duchenne muscular dystrophy company well beyond the first program that we have. And as I said, we're entering the clinic um, by the end of this year for Duchenne. This is our pipeline. We have a broad area where we can apply our technology. And I want to call out um, specifically, there's, you'll see a collabor collaboration with Pfizer. That's outside of our neurological focus. So we intend to be independently operating in um, these first three disease areas. But we knew that the technology could have applications to other conditions that should be treated and should be considered. And so we have a partnership with Pfizer, and they have the opportunity to name additional candidates, mostly in the hepatic area, outside of what we're focused on. So natural oligonucleotides make poor drugs. They've been around for a long time. There's about 25 or 30 years of history of studying these. Chemistry has to be applied to make them more stable. In most cases, this chemistry is applied and actually creates a, a mixture. Stereoisomers are molecules with identical chemical composition, but different three-dimensional arrangement of the atoms. So keep that three-dimensional piece in mind. They often possess different pharmacologic properties, and this can impact things that are really important, like safety and efficacy. 
This complex pharmacology of stereoisomer drug mixtures has a greater potential to diminish the end game of safety and efficacy. So you, you introduce things like toxicity, and so then you make compromises in the drug development process. A full characterization of drug mixtures has been recommended by the FDA since 1992. Phosphorothiorate chemical modifications are introduced into nucleic acid-based therapies that then adopt this random three-dimensional arrangement during synthesis. This results in exponentially diverse drug mixtures with two to the end stereoisomers. Actually, it simplifies it. It's about 500,000 different drugs within the mixture. So it's hard to know what's causing good effect and what's causing harm. <coughs> WAVE, our foundational chemistry, is based on this important concept of chirality in oligonucleotide therapies. The PS, or phosphorothiorate backbone modification, is introduced, provides good stability and bioavailability, but it also introduces chirality to each linkage. linkage. So you see here the hands. If you put your hands together, you can't overlay your right hand and your left hand exactly. They don't fit. Or think about a baseball glove. If you've ever put your left hand in a right-handed glove, it's not really a good fit. WAVE and our foundational principles to control the orientation of these chiral linkages. By precisely designing and controlling chirality, we then improve stability, potency, specificity, and immunogenicity. So our approach is on your right. The traditional method is on the left. Each nucleic acid therapy is made of strings of nucleotides held together by chemical linkages. The orientation of atoms at each linkage occurs randomly using conventional synthesis, adopting either an up or down orientation. These random orientations have implications, as I said, for all of the main qualities that we're looking for in drug development. When we control these orientations with the red or blue arrows, we make specific chemical modifications at those orientations. We create what we call a stereopure approach. So WAVE is focused on exon 51 skipping for Duchenne for our first program. We do have other exons that we're working on in parallel in our preclinical development program. And as you know, exon skipping is a strategy in which sections of genetic code are skipped allowing the creation of partially functional dystrophin. For this dystrophin protein to work, it must have both ends of the protein in place. We're skipping exon 51 with our first program, and we're using our stereopure chemistry approach to do that. We have identified our development candidate for exon 51, so we're still a preclinical company. As I said, we'll be in the clinic at the end of this year. The process starts, and Stu alluded to this earlier, we select a target sequence. So if you go back to high school chemistry, or for those kids that are in the room, pay attention in high school chemistry, because you'll never know when it could become important. But that select target sequence happens through a lot of experiments and a lot of work in the lab. What WAVE's been able to do is develop rules about sequence selection, so we're streamlining that process with every program that we're working on. We then control the chirality, we optimize the chemistry, so we may have 10 or 12 candidates that look good or sequences that we want to take forward. We optimize that chemistry and then we test our lead oligomers. That led us to our investigational compound, um, which is a bunch of confusing numbers, 210-201 for our first program. We have tested this lead in vitro for efficacy and in vivo for tolerability, and we're moving forward. So this slide shows you the dose response on skipping efficiency for our lead um, program that we're taking forward. And we, it is dose dependent. If you look on the top, that blue line, that's the wave compound compared to a PMO ASO and a PS um, antisense oligonucleotide. This is the western blot that um, demonstrates a dose dependent in dystrophin protein increase expression in vitro. So all the way over on the right-hand side of the slide, you see the dose-dependent increase. The important thing to take away here is that we're not using any transvection agents. So we're not modifying anything to get these types of results. And then this slide shows the result of dystrophin protein expression in two different cell lines with different mutations. So again, looking all the way to the right, the wave 
210-201, and that level of green shows you the dystrophin. Our investigational compound is on track to be in the clinic by the end of this year. What that means is that we'll be dosing our, we intend to dose our first patient by the end of the year. So all of the data to date is preclinical, and we now need to actually get into the clinic. Um, we do intend to have a global trial. Our first study will be safety. So someone earlier showed the phase one process. It will be a single ascending dose study. Our plan is to have boys ages 5 to 18 in that study. Again, single ascending dose safety study. Um, we do have our protocols been in development with the entire DMD community. We've been able to meet with um, patient groups both in the U.S. and ex-U.S. and PPMD engaged in a protocol review with us. Our study plan is to include patients previously treated with other exon skipping therapies after a washout period. And as I mentioned earlier, we have initiated GMP manufacturing, and we have 90,000 square feet of manufacturing space that we plan to open in a couple of weeks. Thank you.